please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mario Monti. Sorry? Yeah, try speaking. Yeah, that works. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, incredible but real event that each year is being put up by the students at Warwick. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to exchange views, really, with you. I'll try not to uh, take too much time with uh, the uh, unilateral presentation of my views. Um, I think that we are all uh, interested in uh, what uh, Europe uh, is doing, is trying to do, where it is heading to. I must say that uh, it was uh, in this country, I think at the beginning of 2015, that I first uh, delivered a speech, it was at Oxford, uh, using in the title the word disintegration. The title was Towards European Disintegration? Question mark. Believe me, it was not uh, usual at that time, and some people were shocked because uh, had long uh, known me as uh, not only a strong advocate of European integration, but as somebody having uh, European integration in his heart, not only in his mind. Uh, so maybe I will use this opportunity at, at Warwick today to give you a feeling of what I feel today about European disintegration, where the question mark has gone and uh, to what extent that this is still in place. Uh, perhaps I should first uh, give you a very brief uh, uh, outline of uh, why I was uh, concerned that a process of uh, EU integration might have started at that time. Um, what uh, I saw, you, you, uh, you please keep in your minds that uh, I've been studying the EU throughout my adult life. I have been uh, working for 10 years, uh, as was said, uh, at the European Commission, so the executive of the EU. Um, and uh, then when I was uh, uh, for a brief uh, time in charge of the Italian government, uh, the EU and the Eurozone were one of the most critical playground for our government since uh, the risk was high that Italy might have to say goodbye to the Eurozone and uh, unlike what might have happened but did not in the case of Greece, uh, most uh, people in the markets uh, believed at the time, uh, 2011, that uh, uh, should uh, uh, Italy succumb to a financial crisis, given its size, that could well mark the end of the uh, euro as a single currency. So Europe has always been at the center of my uh, concerns, joys, fears, sometimes disappointments. And why was I concerned uh, in 2014, 2015, that the process of uh, integration might change a sign? Well, basically for a political reason. Uh, the uh, Eurozone financial crisis had been overcome, yes, that was quite an achievement, 
and the governance of the Eurozone and in part of the whole EU had in the process been somewhat improved. But I was worried already when I was at uh, the table, the table of the heads of governments uh, in the EU called, as you know, the European Council. When I was there in 2011, 2012 to represent Italy, I was already concerned by one fact, namely that there were 27 of us um, nominally working on those days, on those meetings, uh, to take uh, collectively the best possible decision in the interest of the European Union, except that uh, most of us uh, uh, were politicians having in mind, first and foremost, uh, their domestic political uh, landscape and in uh, casting their vote, in taking their position in this collective decision-making process for the EU, what they had uh, primarily in mind was the question, well, what I do here, how will it affect my position in the elections in two years' time? And if it is in two years, which is a long time, a secular time for a politician, uh, how is what I'm cooperating in doing here today, how is it affecting my standing in the next public opinion poll next week? So, whereas in the more remote past, uh, the construction of the EU had been seen by the political leadership of member states as an investment in the future, um, with the, the changes occurring in the features of domestic political life, mind you, in European countries, but not only in them, uh, the relationship with the, the endeavor called EU was structurally changing. The common features to our domestic political systems uh, um, uh, were being a rapidly increasing degree of short-termism in the decision-making horizon of politicians, in the style and format of the debates. One thing was to do politics uh, 20 or 40 years ago. Just think when Robert Schuman on the 9th of May of 1950, the foreign minister of France, that was just five years after the end of the war, uh, proclaimed in a radio uh, statement um, that uh, France was launching the idea that France and Germany and also the other willing countries should put together their industries for coal and steel, the industries that, were, that had been crucial in providing the instruments to do war to each other, put them together under a single common authority in order to build a system in which it would be even physically impossible for Germany and France to go to war as they had acquired the unpleasant habit of doing every X years of our history. Uh, and that was started and that was achieved uh, in, in the Treaty of Paris of 1951, one year after this pronouncement, this visionary pronouncement. Just think if uh, under the instruments that we reasonably consider instruments of uh, a legitimate democratic uh, uh, state today, well, the minimum you would have asked today with the mindset of today for those decisions uh, would have been a referendum. 
All historians will tell you that a referendum in France and Germany five years after the war, with the wounds still so uh, real, uh, would have given a vast majority of uh, that is a very crazy idea. So, the, to me, this is puzzling because the greatest ever act of European integration, the one most linked to peace, the one which has proved to be the most successful, was adopted under conditions that we probably today would not consider as fulfilling the minimum standards of a democratic participation. Uh, 60 years uh, uh, later, uh, we are in a system where the 140 characters of a tweet, the 10 seconds of a TV spot uh, in an electoral debate put politicians under totally different constraints. They have to deliver instantly and they are becoming uh, magicians in the art of followership, which is, of course, the opposite of the art of leadership. And they uh, compete on who is the best on taking on board what comes out second by the second through the public opinion polls, the analysis of the social uh, media, etc. And uh, then, of course, it is much more difficult for a politician to endure the determination that it takes to make an investment like uh, in the European Union, where everybody reasonably is convinced that in the long term it will be, yes, in the collective interest of Europe, but also in the specific interest of each member state to have uh, common defense, uh, etc., etc. So, um, this has put uh, under stronger and stronger constraints the mechanism of uh, erogating political will from the national level, from the domestic level, where real power still belongs, onto the EU level. That is why when uh, uh, the EU has had a number of its uh, crises, including of identity, when a referendum uh, went uh, the wrong way, etc., etc., and uh, I was still working in Brussels during some of those moments, like uh, typically one Irish referendum normally goes wrong uh, every uh, few years. Uh, then there is a, uh, a, a collective uh, process of uh, uh, bloody self-flagellation among uh, the European commissioners, the members of the European Parliament, etc. And many uh, intelligent, uh, well-meant uh, people were saying we have to change everything in European politics at the EU level to make the EU more interesting to citizens. What we should do is to make the EU level political arena uh, much more similar to the political arena that there is in each of our countries, where, at least at that time, it was possible to say where citizens do participate in uh, high numbers to the elections, etc. My view was uh, the opposite. My view was that indeed the EU was going through serious crises, but that uh, the origin of those EU crises resided back home in all the member states, and that therefore we either uh, would be able to gain in due course a, of course, a democracy. I don't want other 
systems of governance, but a more responsible democracy, one which is more able to look into the long term, etc. Or else we would be going to lose uh, at the same time our democracies because people would turn to more authoritarian regimes if democracy is not able to deliver the solutions for the long term. Currently, we are leaving only to the People's Republic of China the uh, exclusivity of caring about the long term. They have plans for 2049 in, in particular. I heard this from the mouth of the president of China. Uh, they have a short-term plan for 2021 because, of course, it will be the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Communist Party of China and the slightly longer, not really long-term in their mindset, plan for 2049 because, of course, it will be, might be, the 100th anniversary of the uh, Chinese Revolution. We are all confined to the next elections, the next poll, etc., etc. Um, and of course, uh, the more domestic politics are so introflected, um, unable to look wider in terms of uh, space, international relations, and in terms of time, short termism. Uh, the more this feeds nationalism and anti-integrationism. Um, because it's much... Uh, is, I mean, I am able in 10 seconds to tell you that if a country uh, has many unemployed because it's, its goods are not so competitive, let's just close our borders to foreign products, less than 10 seconds, and apparently seductive. To explain that this may look attractive, but over history it can be shown that whenever countries closed up, then they started an economic and social and political decline, etc., etc. If you're very good, it takes one to two minutes, and you're lost in a political debate. Now, uh, these uh, evolutions are not just uh, in our European uh, countries. Uh, just look at the features of the presidential campaign of 2016 in, uh, in the US, for example. Um, so I was really fearing that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the new style of making politics at the domestic level would gradually eat up European integration that it had been creating. Uh, because each uh, uh, head of government would participate in the decision moments at the EU level, not with the spirit of bringing a, a brick at a time from home in order to build the European house, but if possible to take out a brick at a time from the semi-finished European house to use it at home to dissect it, uh, to disintegrate it so as to generate drops or grams of political consensus at home. Now, of course, the uh, pinnacle of my own personal concern that disintegration may indeed be the new direction in Europe was reached on that day in March 2016 when the British people voted by a narrow margin uh, for uh, Brexit. I was then really fearing that uh, this would create a new wave of peoples taking and governments taking distance from European integration. I'm glad to say that I was wrong. And uh, you know what happened. Uh, 
rather quickly after the Brexit vote, uh, which was, of course, totally uh, legitimate, uh, many things changed in the rest of Europe at all the different levels. Uh, in the public opinion polls, rather quickly, in all countries but one, which is Italy, the sentiment pro-EU and pro the Euro went up after the Brexit vote. Um, on the occasions where people did go to vote, because there were elections, starting from Spain a couple of days after the Brexit vote, the scores of the parties which were considered to be making a big result because they were anti-EU um, was not brilliant. Um, there were some ups and downs, for example, in Austria, the, the presidential elections, uh, uh, and then more recently also the parliamentary elections, uh, but not all populism in European countries is uh, anti-EU populism, so the picture is more complex. And uh, here, here, uh, I have the impression, of course I'm no longer there, that the individual heads of governments taking part in European decisions, decision-making, after the Brexit vote, have become more responsible. Why? because they have seen a former colleague of them, Prime Minister Cameron, having done something and having had in reward something else. It was clear to everybody that Cameron was calling the referendum totally legitimate act, certainly not to improve the prospects of the European Union, certainly not in the national interest of the UK, not even in the general interest uh, of the rather narrow concept, uh, the interest of the Conservative Party in the UK, but more narrowly in the hope of strengthening his position within the Conservative Party. The others, having seen what happened to him and to the UK, have become, this is my impression, a bit more cautious uh, in uh, playing with the EU for domestic political purposes. And governments and peoples have been seeing not only the immediate domino effect of the referendum on all the political figures in the UK, winners and losers alike, strangely, but the, the total disarray into which the decision, the public decision-making system of this country has fallen and has not recovered from yet. You will know that, for example, seen from Brussels, uh, the British government had always been, had not always been loved, but had always been revered as one of the strongest players in the European arena. Where the uh, seamless cooperation in making the best decision in the interest of the UK between academia, think tanks, civil service, politicians, top political leaders, um, had been, well, a very powerful war machine in a sense in the European uh, fights on peaceful decision-making. All that has evaporated. And there has been a fracture in each nexus of this, in each ring of this 
chain. Um, this uh, has forced, this evidence has forced other countries to have a, a reappraisal of the costs and benefits of belonging to the EU. Not all made of love, not all out of uh, uh, newly found positive arguments, but largely made of newly found, scaringly negative evidence on what may happen to a very strong country which does that. I must say that in each of our countries there are parties, including in Italy, who know little or nothing about EU decision-making, but try to impress domestic electorates by saying, no, 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 we don't like uh, the current uh, government. Uh, we, need, uh, uh, we need a government that goes to Brussels and is ready to fight, che batte i pugni sul tavolo, etc., etc., and uh, to, to, to negotiate strongly which could uh, threaten the withdrawal of, for example, Italy from the EU or from the Eurozone, unless more favorable conditions are granted by the other 27 or by the other 26. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have seen has been the very little ability to extract any advantage in negotiation on the part not of a minuscule uh, party of a half powerful country, but by Her Majesty's government of the traditionally stronger component of the EU. So I think this is also an admonition to continue to encourage governments to try to bring their contribution to improving decision-making in the EU, also in everybody's, in, uh, in the interest of each particular country. Each one has his idea of what the EU should be doing, which is more than the legitimate. But we have seen, through the British example, that the value of a threat actually of an executed threat is very, very low. Now, uh, I have a few minutes left. Um, now, we have seen the series of electoral results, particularly the Macron uh, uh, bold success, because he's been the first one after Brexit not to, not to refrain from campaigning against the EU, but he has been the first one after Brexit to very proactively and boldly campaign for the EU in the French national political game, and he won on that. Then we have seen the elections uh, in Germany. By the way, we may, mm, we may smile at seeing uh, the Hercules uh, fatigue uh, of Germany in producing a grand coalition. Um, but, uh, you know, they produce coalitions on the basis of a 200-page uh, Koalitionsvertrag, which means Treaty of the Coalition, which uh, details on all major issues what decisions will then be taken by the coalition. So, as one would suspect, given their style, uh, they are less brilliant in the short term than uh, many others. They certainly contradict uh, uh, what uh, in many national psychologies would be the requirement number one for a good electoral system, namely, to know on the Sunday evening who will govern for five years. They contradict this, and yet they have a quite powerful democratic system which acts slowly in order.
and through persuasion. Now, um, we will have uh, soon, as uh, some of you might know, elections in Italy on the 4th of March. Um, uh, very difficult uh, to have a view of what might come out, but I just observe that there were parties in Italy which until a few months ago were openly in favor either of uh, Italy exiting the euro or in a more, uh, in, in a softer formulation, in favor of calling a referendum to consult Italians on whether Italy should leave the euro or not. By the way, the Italian constitution has uh, some features that one may like or, or not. In my view, it is profoundly wise, at least in one respect. There are referenda admissible in Italy and many have been held, but there are two f fields in which uh, the fathers of the Italian constitution in 1947 um, decided that uh, there could not be referenda. One is the whole area of taxation. And the other one is the area of international treaties. Because there is something not so rational in submitting for example, the ratification of an international treaty to referendum, because you give the people the idea that they will have a say on that treaty, whereas they will only have a say on the adherence or not of their country to that treaty. And an international treaty is, by definition, a compromise between two or more countries. So submitting it to referendum may give the impression that it is possible not to accept this, but to accept something else, which is far from clear. I'm not referring to Brexit specifically now. So the... Um, it, in recent months and weeks, no party anymore has a stance against uh, the EU. Everybody likes aspects of the EU, dislikes other aspects like it is normal, but there are no longer uh, clear positions of wanting to leave the, uh, the Euro or the uh, EU. So I believe that Italy with the uh, the government that will eventually come out uh, will participate with uh, Germany and France. This time, maybe one should say France and Germany, given the vigor and the youthful boldness of President Macron, to the reformulation of some aspects of the, uh, of the in particular, of the governance of the Eurozone. And with this, I would like to conclude by using uh, no more than three or four minutes on what is, to me, now the main problem that we have in the European Union, economically and politically. It is no longer, I believe, the threat of uh, disintegration, also because I reluctantly have to underline again Brexit, which I believe will be a big loss for the UK and also for the EU, probably more for the UK than for the EU, but certainly is not a loss for the EU in terms of pushing to disintegration. On the contrary, among the, the few benefits for the EU from Brexit is, as I said, like from Mr. Trump, the de facto pushing for more cohesion and will to work together among us. Um, the, the, uh, the, the problem that I see, therefore, is not so much, 
may always come back, but not in the short and medium term, a risk of disintegration. Uh, although one should make a caveat concerning the new forms of uh, impatience with the EU shown by some countries of Central and Eastern Europe, like Poland and Hungary. But uh, I would say more generally, the mutual mistrust that we are experiencing in the EU now. And it is a mistrust that uh, has been developing a lot due to the Eurozone crisis between North and South. I could speak for two hours on this because when I was governing Italy, much of my time was devoted to trying to overcome this mistrust. Just one anecdote, I was also finance minister for a part of that period. And I remember when I went as finance minister to the first Eurogroup meeting, where the finance ministers of the countries belonging to the EU were reunited. I introduced myself to the few of them whom I, I didn't know already. Among them was a nice lady, the finance minister of Austria, um, an affable uh, and moderate uh, and smiling lady, but uh, she greeted me saying, uh, nice to meet you, prime minister. And then she completely changed the expression, raised her finger. But you should know that Austrians are fed up of paying for Italians. <laughs> and I said, Madam Minister, I fully understand this, but could you mention to me one example of where Austrians paid for Italians? And she said, Yes, I know, it's not true, but they believe so. <laughs> so, and, and Austria is, is a moderate north relative to other countries. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, so the mistrust between north and south and now between west and east within the European Union. Uh, the, the mistrust, uh, in my view, should also be, I mean, overcoming this mistrust should also, in my view, be the guiding star for improving the economic governance of the EU. We have recently seen a, a, a highly sophisticated uh, document produced by seven French and seven German uh, highly reputed economists, which uh, should serve as an intellectual basis for Macron and Merkel to work on. It's really excellent as an economic document. To me, it does not address the fundamental problem of how to change the governance in such a way that the profound mutual mistrust could be set aside. And just in a nutshell, now if you take the Stability and Growth Pact, the North countries, Germany and others, are upset because countries in the south, south begins in France, um, have played all sorts of games with the complicity of the Commission, they would say, to apply huge doses of flexibility, in fact circumventing the 3% limit on the deficit to GDP ratio. And they are right, the countries of the north. The countries of the South, on the other hand, are also right because they point to the fact that conceptually the Stability and Growth Pact is no longer apt to capturing economic governance in today's Europe. First of all, because it does not grant a special status to government spending, yes, but government spending for productive, public investments, which have an important role in the economy. So they are right, the southern countries, to condemn the Nordic countries because they are not ready to introduce this change. To me, for example, 
it would not be, it would be neither Machiavellian nor highly sophisticated uh, from an academic point of view, but simple, easy to explain to people, and, and susceptible of having this mutual disarmament of mistrusts to say, okay, we modify the stability pact in order to give a clear role to public investments, but then we eliminate uh, all these intricate forms of flexibility which are perceived in the North as uh, uh, nice instruments of uh, uh, circumvention. Sorry, I've spoken too long. I shut up and uh, I am uh, uh, here to try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for that. I think it was extremely fascinating to be able to understand the situation from your perspective. So thanks a lot. Um, wow, we've got 190 upvotes. It's never happened before. Just to explain, um, these are questions sent in by the audience uh, on an app, and then they vote for the ones that they really like, and those are the ones that get asked. So they're also on the screens on both sides. Uh, to move to the first question. Do you believe that Jean-Claude Juncker's plan to extend the euro to the entire EU is economically sensible given the different needs of certain EU countries? I think this plan, uh, which was flagged last September by President Juncker, is uh, legally sensible, first of all, institutionally sensible, because uh, uh, most countries who are not yet uh, in the euro do not have uh, an opt-out from the euro in any sort of treaty, so they are expected, they are supposed to be part of the euro. Uh, it is uh, true that uh, uh, a country should not join, should and could not join the euro before it is uh, substantially and really ready for that. Some people are convinced that many of the, of the problems of Greece in the last several years uh, were due to Greece joining the euro in a somewhat hasted uh, manner. Um, so uh, the there will be a trade-off to be made because certainly in the historical design of the EU, which one may like or not, um, the single currency is not just a technical element. It is the, uh, the cherry on, on the cake also of a political construction. Uh, the important thing is uh, Yes, to insist on having the cherry, but also in making sure first that there is the cake. And uh, for example, some countries that are in the euro are not so keen in complying with all the rules of the single market. The UK used to be keener on that, although it uh, didn't love the cherry at all, as we know. Um, which is a contradiction to be in, uh, uh, in, in the in, uh, EMU, but to care more about the M, monetary union, than about the E, which should be the prerequisite economic union. So, uh, I th if I were the president of the commission, I would push like Mr. Juncker does uh, for this, in the awareness that, for example, the ECB, which uh, has the responsibility then of handling the euro, is quite uh, cool on having all countries in before they are very, very deeply tested for a long time on their ability to meet all the criteria. So I think this is one of the matters that will remain for some time in a grey zone. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next question. 
and it's, do you feel the Italian's debt problem regarding corruption, structural issues, and political instability could trigger the next global financial crisis? No. <laughs> A resounding no. I must say that uh, probably there is not a single person in the world as uh, uh, aware as uh, I am of uh, the relevance of Italy for the Eurozone. I've seen it, I've tested it. When I came in, uh, the markets were telling us uh, that there was in their estimation, a 35 to 40 percent probability of default. People complained in Italy because we introduced a deep pension reform lasting for the whole future. Uh, but people did not realize that we might not have, at the end of November 2011, at the end of December, at the end of January, the money to pay the existing pensions. So we had first to make sure that we could pay salaries and pensions. Uh, and that required also changing the trajectory for the future of pensions. So, and as I said, I think, during my presentation, at that time, uh, in case Italy uh, had gone down, uh, there, there, there simply wasn't the money available from the EU and the IMF combined in order to put up uh, a rescue of Italy as was done for Greece, Portugal, uh, and Ireland, and then others. Now, having said that, there, there may be moments in which uh, uh, Italy may be the tilting point. I must say that there is uh, a huge uh, tendency by international observers and the markets to magnify the problems that could come out of Italy. Another anecdote here, in uh, 1983, I was a very young economist, and uh, I was asked uh, to give a presentation on the Italian economy, which nobody could understand at the time or now, uh, in front of the Trilateral Commission. So I had uh, the Kissingers, the Rockefellers, the Agnellis, the Brzezinskis, and I was... Uh, a shy young economist. Um, and uh, I prefaced my paper, because then I was diligent. I prepared papers for presentations, not like today. And uh, I, I put two quotes uh, as, as a foreword, uh, one from the Wall Street Journal and one from the uh, New York Times, three months apart. One was, uh, two headlines, one was, will Italy go drown, down the drain to Bangladesh? Question mark. The other one was, will Italy become the next strong man of Europe? Question mark. So you see the uh, difficulty of perceiving this uh, strange uh, and formidable country. Uh, but, uh, I remember, for example, that the day after the Brexit results, and for several weeks, I, and I'm sure many other Italian economists or politicians, were, was overwhelmed by interviews from the BBC, CNN, uh, CNBC, etc., on the question, you agree, don't you, Mr. Monti, that after Brexit, now the next big thing which could derail the Eurozone and the European integration is Italy because of the banks and because of the referendum in December on the Constitution. I said, no, I do not agree. In my view, the Italian banks have some problems not greater than the average of banking systems in other countries. 
and the constitutional referendum, uh, on which I had at the time a view which I consider to be a minority view because I voted no. Then it turned out that many people voted no. But as expected, that did not produce any little bip in the financial markets, not at all. So I mentioned this because I think that the, um, uh, well, uh, as the debt problem is one thing, it may come out also from corruption, uh, but to trigger the next global financial crisis, the causation could be in principle from the public debt to the global financial crisis, irrespective whether the public debt is, is due to corruption or other things. So at any rate, uh, in, a, in a lump sum uh, response, uh, my answer is no. There will have to be a, a close attention paid to uh, Italy, but uh, <coughs> uh, I'm not aware that Spain has triggered uh, smaller than Italy, of course, but still has triggered a global financial crisis with uh, political problems and corruption problems and institutional and constitutional problems considerably greater than ours for the time being. Thank you. Moving to the next question. How would you mitigate the increasing levels of sovereign debts seen in Italy? It seems to be a direct line between Aberdeen and Rome. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is uh, indeed uh, a, a serious uh, problem. We have a debt to debt, not uh, annual deficit. The annual deficit of Italy, let me also give some glimpse of uh, sunshine. Uh, Italy had that huge financial difficulty in, 19, uh, in uh, 2011. It is Italy, the only country in the whole of Southern Europe which came out of that financial crisis without, see, without asking, uh, with all due respect to the Austrian lady, without uh, asking uh, a single euro to anybody abroad, and without uh, uh, having a troika in Rome. Um, it is true that many Italians uh, um, hate me and call me troika, as, as I uh, was a prime minister embodying uh, all the evils of the troika, but uh, those countries which have had the Troika knows perfectly well what it is. Um, the, so Italy has come out uh, um, without any foreign financial assistance, without Troika, and already since the spring of 2013, the EU took Italy out of the so-called excessive deficit procedure because it went then below 3% and still is, whereas, for example, France and Spain are not. Having said that, uh, it is a very high level of uh, debt. Um, <coughs> the, the ideas around uh, are uh, uh, multiple, uh, probably a combination of uh, further privatizations, uh, of uh, keeping the control on the annual deficit very, very tight, on having to run, as we do, a, a fairly substantial surplus in the primary balance, that is total expenditure minus taxes minus interest payments, which is now around 4% 4, 4 of GDP, uh, some would say, I'm not pronouncing here, 
some would say introduce a wealth tax because we have at the same time a huge uh, wealth in the private sector and a huge debt in the public sector. Um, so there are um, various, uh, various uh, ways of uh, tackling the problem, which is a problem and now the next time that I have uh, either an alarm or a bright idea on Italy's debt, I know where to call. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. Um, do you think it's feasible that we could see a United States of Europe in the near future with a completely socially and politically integrated EU? No. This is Edinburgh now, not Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, 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 I wish uh, to the senders of these uh, very clever questions that uh, we might uh, hopefully see uh, much maybe to their disappointment uh, a continuing uh, United Kingdom. Uh, but not uh, the uh, United States of Europe, am I all of a sudden going back to the fear of disintegration? Am I a non-lover of European integration? No, but I believe that uh, we probably will never get uh, to the United States of Europe in the sense uh, of what they have in the US in the USA, but I think that that doesn't really matter so much. To me, uh, to paraphrase the words, to me, Europe is uh, not a state, is a flux, something that changes. And provided the EU moves towards being more similar to the United States of America, that's good. And uh, I would like to conclude here uh, you remember the famous uh, Henry Kissinger's sentence on uh, who should the US president call if he wants to speak uh, uh, with uh, Europe? Which telephone number? There's no... Uh, he probably was referring to American presidents who might ever have thought of calling uh, Europe. Then the problem of the number was the one um, well, there are areas where the EU is more advanced than the, the US. For example, in an area where I loved <coughs> to work, competition policy in Brussels, where now the very prestigious uh, uh, European Competition Commissioner is uh, uh, Margaret Vestager, there in competition, uh, we do not need to become the United States of Europe because we are more advanced than the United States of America. They have, uh, I mean, uh, when, when we took a decision on the Microsoft case in 2004, imposing a fine, but above all, forcing Microsoft to change aspects of its business model, we took a decision from Brussels for the then 27 member states. Uh, in the US, whenever they had a Microsoft case or other cases, it was a mosaic of inconsistent uh, decisions because they have not one, but two competition authorities at the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department. On top of that, or below that, they have 50 attorneys general in the states, also with antitrust competences. So this is interesting, don't want to exaggerate it, but it shows that in a Europe that we believe to be totally sclerotic, adverse <coughs> to change, above all to change the institutions, we have achieved in the area of competition something that the Americans would like to achieve, but they are under different lobbies 
and are not able to. And also, you know, you remember when the Banque de France, so the Bank of Italy, the Deutsche Bundesbank, were more powerful than their respective governments. It was decided to set up the single currency. Those national central banks still exist, but they are, I wouldn't say branches of the ECB, but they are components of a European system of central banks. They count much less, and it has been possible to achieve this transformation in uh, Europe. So um, we should not uh, be overly optimistic, but sometimes we should be aware that uh, the uh, that the Europeans are not so um, refract refractarian, no, are not so averse to change than reluctant to change uh, as sometimes we believe. Thank you so much. Thank you.